I'm Philip Martin. I am the uh, co-owner of Philip Martin Gallery. I am actually here at the gallery. I often do these from an in undisclosed location, and I'm very excited to be talking with James Morse today. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the works that you see or just about the practice or want to be in touch, just feel free to send me an email. Um, and I hope you've also had a chance to stop by the gallery or meet uh, my partner, uh, Portia Heiner, myself at fairs or here at the gallery. Um, but it's really a pleasure that everyone could come by. So I'm really excited to talk to Jamie here on the occasion of the show um, because there are stars here at the gallery. This is something I'm really excited to do. Jamie and I got to know each other during COVID and through a show that Tom Ray Dodge curated, and it's really been very exciting. So Jamie, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. Good. So Michigan. you are in Northern Michigan somewhere. I am. Uh, you know, I, I just can't help myself, but I do this, you know, which is the state of Michigan. Maybe on Zoom <laughs> flipped, but Detroit is like down here, right? Mm -hmm. Ann Arbor. Yeah. And we're here. This is a wow. peninsula right here at the tip of the peninsula. What it reminds me of is the old Milwaukee Brewers logo, which was one of the best logos oh, of yeah. all time. I don't know why they got rid of it. So genius. So um, we're just going to start here in the sh in the show itself. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, this is a painting called Hidden Lake. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things you were kind of thinking about as you put this put this show together? Uh, you know, I was thinking, I'm always thinking a lot about the big picture, right? Like I, can't, <laughs> I tried to get away from thinking about the big picture, but here we are. Uh -huh. And uh, I spend a lot of time where we live outside mm -hmm. and I enjoy doing that immensely. And so this is a place, it's a real place, this lake, uh, that's you know, it's close to where I live, like in that top left corner, uh, that's kind of more Northport where I live. So it takes about 20 minutes to get down here and then you hike in for a while and, and you find this hidden lake, which is, you know, totally hidden. Mm -hmm. And I've walked down to this lake several times and because it's difficult to get to, and it's not you know, particularly deep or, or wide or anything like that, very few people go there. And so when you're there, you're usually alone. And when you're alone in a place that's so big, you, know, you see so much area with no one there except yourself, I think this lends itself to this type of thinking about the big picture. Like mm -hmm. what's going on, what is, the nature of reality, what does it mean, why are we are, all the questions that people have been asking forever. And rather than like dive into that with a bunch of mumbo jumbo, I just kind of sit there and, and draw it, you know? I, right. I well, your there. connection to place seems to be a huge driver for the work. Um, talk to us a little bit about how your paintings work. Obviously you do some on, you do some in the studio, you do a lot on site. I always love to point out, you told me that you paint paintings from a canoe. Is that really right. true? That's definitely true. There's a couple of paintings in this show that are from the canoe. A mm -hmm. lot of this work was made in the winter. And so, you know, it's difficult to canoe on the ice, but uh, you can ski out there. So it's kind mm -hmm. of the same thing, you know, the same vantage point being in a lake. Uh, this is out at the dunes. But, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of, if they're small, it's very windy here, right? It's windy right now. If, if I take a big canvas outside, it blows all over the place into my lap, you know? So I, I tend to do smaller paintings outside and mm -hmm. draw it. And then the bigger work is done in the studio, looking at these. And I really like looking at something that was a recording of actually looking at the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And then the interpretation of that, sort of sending it through multiple levels of interpreting a real thing, the real space, the world that we live in, you know? That's really interesting because, you know, obviously you've got a few things coming up. One of the things is you're going to participate in um, this David Zorner platform project, but you're also doing a group show coming up here that I'm really excited about called Night Painting. And one of the things about the idea behind Night Painting is that you, in a certain sense, have to work from memory or imagination because in theory, you can't be out in the dark painting because you can't say see your palette though there are people that do it and that's an interesting thing john rippendorf comes to mind um so it just means that in a certain sense this practice of remove of the painting standing you have the thing you're looking at you have an interpretation of the thing you know the, that that play that the painting is not the thing is a really fascinating one that i think gets to the heart of what painting is and it also gets to the heart of 
how the hum how human representation works and how the mind works. Um, do you have any th any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I frequently like the bedroom that I sleep in has these windows that look out kind of mm -hmm. the same windows here in this building over here. And I'll wake up, and the reason I wake up in the middle of the night is because the moon has risen, right? Mm -hmm. and we just had a full moon. I don't know, like maybe a week and a half ago, and it's right. really bright, but it's also completely mesmerizing. And when I wake up and see that moon, I think of you because I'm like, oh shit, I got to make some paintings for this night show. That's right. <laughs> and I said, should I go? Get to work. Get my, yeah, should I get some pencils and try to figure this out right now? And of course, you know, I'm totally sleepy. And so I just go back to sleep. And so you have to, you're forced into this position based on the circumstances that we find ourselves in that you have to sort of make it up as best you can, right? Mm -hmm. That's really fun. Like, I love doing that. And I, I love doing it because, in the way that I try to do it, I don't go for like the way it actually looked, you know, this is very difficult and it's also not what I'm interested in. And I don't go for just the way it felt totally because I do like the way it looks, you know, and I wanna sort of make it clear that that's what I'm looking at, you know, that's making these feelings about our existence then come out in this other way. Mm -hmm. And so sort of going in between the two, both the way that it feels and the way that it looks and striking a middle road is, that's what I've been up to, you know. So when you're talking about, you kind of identified two terms there, what it looks like, how it feels, putting that together. Can you talk a little bit more about, say, being in front of a canvas and and how that's manifested? Uh, yeah. Practice? This painting is called Between Planes, right? Mm -hmm. And that's my canoe. I love to canoe, and I canoe in this place. It's a lake that I don't want many people to go to, so I won't tell you what it's called. But uh, <laughs> when you're in the canoe, I'm like, well, why is it so fun? And we should have done this interview in the shower, you know, because like <laughs> I subscribe to the old way of thinking that all your best ideas, your clarity of thought is at its peak in the shower, you know? Okay. But we'll, we'll, we'll do that for the next one. For the next one, yeah. Um, but uh, when I'm in the canoe, the reason I think it's so enjoyable is because you know, I'm out in the world, mm -hmm. public sphere, right? There's the world, people could see me, animals could see me, every, I'm there. I'm not hiding away, right, someplace. But I'm also basically alone in this canoe and there's the world in front of me and then there's all my thoughts here and I'm in this canoe and the canoe is affected by the world much more than like your house is, right? You mm -hmm. and I were sitting in chairs right now and nothing's really moving around, but in the canoe, it's constantly moving. So you. You can't help but constantly be reminded that here you are floating in the world. And so it's a really pleasant experience for me as, as someone who has squirreled himself away like a hermit up in the tip of some peninsula far away from everything to be out there, not afraid of the world, not embarrassed to be in it or shy from it, but, but to also not have to really do anything. I can be peacefully, quietly just there. Mm -hmm. And so this is, between planes is what I decided to call this one because it's like you're you're between them you're in this third plane right the surface of the water where you have all of the world as it comes to you through your senses but also your interior world but you're out there and so mm -hmm. you know that's something that a painting can do it can show you other people's interiors publicly they're mm -hmm. offering it to you. go ahead and have a look you know this is what it's like inside Maybe I that, that's an amazing thought. And I think um, I think it gets to a question of sort of why human ex why why painting is in this interesting place. I think there are there's there's that importance of expression, I think, has really hit me in my own programming here at the gallery. And I've been showing a lot more painting and I one sees how important it is, how important expression, you know, really is in a, even in sort of a, I don't know, I, I could get kind of revolutionary about it, but um, yeah, I don't, yeah. So that's interesting what you're saying, what you're saying, saying there does in terms of what painting can do as a vehicle for you. Yeah. This here is a, uh... What I wrote on the wall next to where I painted this, um, I will say, I wanted to have the, this is a, a marsh, right? And a mm -hmm. marsh is just a mess. That's really, they're like synonyms, right? And it's a just, everything has grown and it's died and it's grown and it's died for so many years. 
and yeah. it's just so fertile and it's getting beat on by the water and the wind and like a marsh is just a mess mm -hmm. and i wanted to have the mess like i wanted to bring it home with me you know mm -hmm. i wanted to be able to put the mess just right here you know just so i could sit with it at dinner mm -hmm. and, stuff, you know? and like that's kind of what i was trying to do here is just bring home part of that chaos of the world yeah the marsh. but in a way that is not like contained, like you want to own it, but like a sample, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just a sample of that chaotic world, but in a controlled way to allow it in. Cause you can't escape it, right? Like everything is so baloney right now. And it's, we all just kind of have to go through it. There's no, there's no other alternative. Yeah. But to just take it like in the way you would pin moths to a board right. and just have it there. Yeah. That's yeah. actually really interesting because I think in the between two planes painting that what it's making me think of is, you know, I like your point that you are between two planes and it is true when you're in the open water in a canoe, that's a very powerful experience. And I always, I feel like somewhere I did my undergrad in East Asian religions and somewhere along the line, someone suggested that, that monotheism came from desert peoples who lived in places where they had this big experience of kind of, they could have oneness, the environment provided that for them. Whereas polytheistic peoples, if you're living in a jungle and you don't get that kind of vista, you know, you're really in there with all the little parts. Um, so I don't know why I really brought that up, but it came to mind. But it is interesting when you're canoeing in open water, if you then hit these moments where you're in a marsh <laughs> or you're in the stuff, it's kind of like this hassle or you're kind of like, you know, pushing your way through there. Right. That's really interesting that you're that you're kind of a pushing yourself that sound I'm visualizing that you, the canoe is now actually really in there amongst the stuff but I also like the idea that you're saying that what the painting can do is is bring that into your I like the idea that the dining room table itself kind of becomes the canoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like um there's something that I say when I'm nervous and I have to go do something because it's an obligation or something, right? It's like, well, you can either just be scared and not do it, or you can just go scared, right? And that's, you know, kind of how life is right mm -hmm. now. So if you bring this, it's like, you know, I have two kids and they're like, uh, you know, nine and then six or five. And it's like looking under the bed, right? <laughs> you look under the bed and you see, oh, it's not so bad. And so if you bring that chaos home, if you bring the mess inside and you just always have it as a mm -hmm. reminder, it doesn't hurt you. It's not afflicting you in any way. Then it makes it easier to be in that situation where you just have to do it scared, which yeah, is I, really I, what we're all doing. I really, I really like this because it's funny that I have stopped on this painting and obviously it's behind me and I actually chose it for this. It's interesting because as we're going to see, you know, we've got big vistas in some of the other paintings and it is, it's really interesting. And then of course the color palette is really fantastic in this painting. Um, so this is, yeah, it's totally great. This is the, uh, the, the painting over my, my other shoulder. And uh, I see a little uh, tip of the hat to Homer, Winslow Homer there. Very big tip of the hat. <laughs> uh, this is uh you know, on the water, we have shoals. You can see that mm -hmm. little red, that's like, a, that's how they warn you if you're in a boat, right? You got, you got a shallow draft here. You're going to snag your keel on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ducks, they like the shoals because they can feed a lot there, right? The mm -hmm. fish like the shoals and so then the mm -hmm. ducks like the fish. Um, and like Homer, for me, has, has always been a big influence. And I like the world that he lived in and looked at, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I just adore Homer's colors and everything. And so I came in here after seeing these rafts of ducks come in, in like the, the early spring, a raft of ducks is not like a raft, but like just many ducks, right? A flock. And there's just huge quantities of them and they're gorgeous. And if you have binoculars yeah. and you're looking at them, you can just, it's just like a terrific time of year when these birds come through. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, all right, I'm mean, just go inside. And I just painted Homer's duck. You know, mm -hmm. which I basically totally memorized this painting. Mm -hmm. that that's the, the big diving one that's yeah, in the center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it's just a place where it's so fertile there. Like so that's, that's you kind of started with that, is what you're saying. Yeah, that was there on its own. And then everything else kind of came around it. Oh, wow. And painting these, 
these figures of ducks really loosely, you know, just, yeah, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, but just trying to be a duck, you know, yourself, <laughs> trying to, what is it like to live in the way that a duck lives, which is totally different than what you yeah. and I do. And, and the, the fluidity of all that. Yeah. Is trying to express emotions of whatever's going on. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing because, you know, you went, you were talking earlier about um, how a painting can provide you a sort of sense of your inner, one's inner life and connect, could have that co communication with other people. And the duck in the Homer painting that's here, it is a very striking, strange moment because you can't quite tell what's going on. Like, I can't tell if that duck is diving or was it, is it, has it been shot? Like, it's a kind of odd pictorial moment that's really captured in time forever as this image of a duck. And also, you know, a lot of people don't even know what ducks look like. I'm hardly a duck expert and I'm probably more versed in duckage than many other people. So I think that's really fascinating to choose that. I mean, I think people often are sort of like, might quote a figure or something like that. And then the idea that you built around it. I also think that's interesting that, you know, with the shoal, that's, that's a big comment or th thinking in ecology and environmental science and just science in general at this point, that it's these edge areas is where there's a lot of life and activity. So between shallow, something like shallow land and water, like there, that, that's an edge. And then that lots of stuff kind of gets in there. Right. That's really interesting. I think too, like, I don't enjoy doing what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyways. Can we go back to the duck painting? Like do after it. the act, there's, you can look at this thing and be like, what, you know, what is even going on here? It's like, you know, Homer drops and then you have Homerness, right? Painting in the <laughs> head. Just well, I didn't immediately look at this and think this was Homer. I just was like, that duck is, we how do I know that duck? And then it took, and then, I, and then it it's took like, me a while. Right, it's like, it's like if you have a jingle, you know, like NBC or ABC, dun, 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 mm -hmm. you no, know, you're like, okay, so Homer's here. And then the other ducks are like getting out of the way. Yeah. And we have to get out of the way because we can't just do what Homer did, you know, and there are ghosts of the Homerness that yeah. linger in contemporary sure. practice, right? Yeah. So this whole thing can be looked at, and I don't think that's what I was thinking when I was making it, but now looking at it as really just my practice of painting and yeah. the ghosts that are hanging around, all these books of the people yeah. that I adore, their work, totally. and, and trying to be there with them, get out of the way, do the yeah. same thing. Don't do the day, you know? Yeah. And that's kind of what's going on. It's like a giant chaotic feeding frenzy. <laughs> yeah. And that's well, all think, Well, you know, we bring these things to our to our lives and to our practice and things flow through our minds. And, you know, it's not Homer's duck, it's your duck. It's also funny because I think actually my recognition of, and this is another, you know, bird and landscape. It my grandfather was a painter and Sky Glabish, you know, sort of. I thought I knew the group of seven, the Canadian artists, but I actually didn't. I realized I don't know anything about them. I got this catalog. And I was like, whoa. And I think that's how I recognize the duck is actually my grandfather in the 1930s was painting this duck or looking at it. Clearly, obviously, Homer was so famous at that point. Anyway, never mind. But this one is uh, an amazing painting um, and a big one for you, five by seven feet. What was it like to make a painting this size? And talk to us a little bit about what's going on here. Uh, you know, painting at this size was new for me, and uh, I was playing a lot of hockey. This was painted in the winter, uh -huh. and we had a little pond where we play hockey, the, the kids and I, and uh, like, it felt like playing hockey. Like, it's so much canvas, you gotta like push the paint around like it's a hockey stick, you know? And uh, <laughs> it's fun. I grew up playing hockey, I love <laughs> skating and being out there, and so this was, uh, there's there, that pine is very specific, right? My wife just got a job at the, the land conservancy here. Uh -huh. They're, they've been working for like, you know, 50 years to protect all the land that is right outside our windows here. And when I talk to some of the field biologists about this pine, mm -hmm. they know it immediately. There's no oh, pine wow. like this anywhere. And the reason that pine is unique and knowable among the vast array of pines that are everywhere, I could see you know thousands just outside this window alone, is because this pine has succeeded in being just annihilated by being right. All of the 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 intensity of being alive has weathered this particular pine in such a way that it is enormous and small at the same time. Uh -huh. You get a lot of California, you know, like these coastal yeah. pines or junipers, maybe sure. high and, altitude. 
yeah, just just the roughest experience, but they made it somehow. They got mm -hmm. through it, you know. And I guess <laughs> listening to what I've been saying, it's like I guess you know we've come through a hard time and we're getting through it, and like this is showing. But this pine is memorable because of that character trait of it that mm -hmm. it's endured, the difficulty of being right. And so this lake is there, and there's a heron that it was always going around and. I saw this battle of two herons last summer, mm -hmm. driving just near to here. And uh, I see something in the road, I don't know what it is. We get closer, oh, it's maybe a heron. And I find out basically that it's one heron has got its legs, his feet, pinning the other heron's wing <laughs> wow. onto the ground, right on the center line of the road, right? And they've got <laughs> both of their beaks like this, and they're just trying to kill each other. It's an wow. epic battle between these two herons. And they're so involved in this struggle that they're having right. that they don't even realize me, who I'm, I'm immediately beside them, you know? Yeah. And I'm just watching like, you know, my God, what's gonna happen, you know? And uh, they sort of see that I'm there and they snap out of it and they just are like, annoyed really is what I would say. <laughs> and they just get up and they leave. And then presumably they went back at it again and one of them lives and the other has died, I don't know. But herons have this, stature that a lot of the other animals around here don't. And I think that they contend with a much more difficult daily existence than a lot of the other creatures do. Mm -hmm. And so the heron is like this blue pine. I feel that I am like this blue pine. Anybody who's made it through the past bit of the rough patch we've come through is just like this. And so this is us. Mm -hmm. And to put them together in tranquility in this place, which is a gorgeous lake, and to do it in blues and to just have, you know, sort of the, the chaos down there and things falling over, but new growth, all this sort of stuff. It, it just seemed like, you know, something I wanted to do. Well, these big birds in the landscape in the Midwest are so amazing. And I'm from Indiana and, um, you know, basically in that area, you have seasonal time. I mean, as a, someone who's now lived in California longer than anywhere else, but it's really interesting to see something like pelicans that I had I, I somehow I don't think I really I thought when I came to California maybe I'd never seen them before but then was home and you you know they're flying over in also other birds you know, tundra geese and things like that they are amazing when they show up in the landscape these like travelers from other places oh yeah and they like if you think about it you know, think of like your neighborhood where you hang out mm -hmm. you know it's so small compared to what a, like a bird's understanding of the neighborhood right mm -hmm. like in the summer we're awoken by uh loons laughing mm -hmm. in the morning and flying by and it's a great way to wake up but you're just like you know they go to breakfast like way over there and then they spend the night way over there and it's just it's a totally different way of being in the world yeah our uh our world is uh loads of parrots there's tons of parrots in my neighborhood um, really are they colorful they're gray parrots and apparently there was a pet store fire at one point that seeded uh my neighborhood with parrots but the big thing actually that dominates my neighborhood are mockingbirds which are i guess in the crow family they're not the largest but they are serious and there's we have a lot of ravens but we also have like a lot of hawks uh -huh. and they spend all day just chasing those other animals around they're really super they're super psycho uh this is a slightly older painting but you and i wanted to put in the show i'm so happy that it's here it's called eastfield yeah this is you know the field to the east of where i'm sitting right now it's a great um, painting we walk through those trees and uh, i made that painting you know i think somebody said that they could feel that this painting is about love mm -hmm. it's true you know um, and this is great. This was actually one of the first paintings for the show that you did. And I'll tell you, we're kind of getting towards the end here. So I don't know if there's other, other thoughts that you have. This is such a beautiful painting. Um, how did it come together? Uh, this is, I did an etching, like a little dry point etching. Uh -huh. uh, it was very small, you know, four mm -hmm. by five film negative. And this is a uh, way up on a dune, it's this place where you kind of, you know, you, you see, it's like Casper David Friedrich, right? You mm -hmm. see 
all that exists out there very easily. And uh, I wanted this to be about sort of the complexity and, and the inability to know the answers to many things, right? This mm -hmm. is sort of like, why? Why is this painting here? Why are any of these things here? These islands out here, the, the water itself, the sun, the dragonfly, like what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. And the only answer I could sort of come to that was uh, satisfying after, you know, going and reading for 35 years or whatever, uh, is that the village, it's here because there are stars, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that's something we can all agree on. And of course we can go down many other avenues and come up with great answers of why everything's here and what it's all about. But like, it's enough that we're here just because there are stars, right? Like the, you have time and <laughs> we're running out of time. Like I've got a pile of books over here, right? That I, in the shower, of course, was gonna <laughs> eloquently tie all this into. That's for our next conversation. James in the shower is the next conversation. Well, like Lauren Isley is a, is a writer from the 20th century who I, I yep. really like a lot. And we've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what that painting's about. I'm gonna this run through a couple other pictures while you're talking, but don't let me interrupt you. Cause when you say that we're here because there are stars, you mean that, you mean in the, you mean that our planet exists because of the big bang, the formation of stars 13.8 billion years ago. Yeah, everything there is, is there because there are stars, you know, and thinking of like the web photographs now. Oh, so amazing. The absurdity of it. Like last night was pretty clear and I got this cold I'm recovering from and I was, up late and I just pull out the binoculars and I'm looking at like the seven sisters mm -hmm. and that's, you know, incredibly bright and easy to see, but you have all these things that look like clouds, but I knew there weren't any clouds just because you can feel it with the humidity. And those were just nebula, right? Other mm -hmm. little clusters. And just thinking about just the, the grandeur of it all mm -hmm. here. And what we're doing is we're trying to just make beautiful things and we're trying to write poetry or we're trying to kill each other or make money or feed our family, whatever it is. Like all of it is just because there are stars, you know? You know, I heard an interesting thing on a podcast I was listening to on the Inca, that the Inca um, not only have constellations that are, I think this is correct, that are the stars themselves, but rather than mapping the, st the lines between the stars to create the shapes, their, their constellations are actually the big black shapes between the stars. Oh, like the negative space. Yes. Wow. That's Which is amazing just from the simple perspective of we're all in the world but seeing things totally differently um so we're kind of wrapping up here i don't know if you have more things you want to add i've got to ask how do you set up a landscape easel in a canoe without it falling over oh no easel that's why they're all small i just fold okay yeah. i'm just see like a weight coming off the side and it's like it just oh yeah I mean, I'm a sailor too. And like, I've thought about using like string up new linen for the sail every time and just paint on the sail when it's full. Uh-huh, nice. Such a mess. The paintings would be horrible. But um, <laughs> these drawings I wanted to put in here. Yeah, because... and you are, you know, you're a furniture maker and obviously the frames are handmade. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, like, it's just, you know, I was a photographer for a while and shooting four by five and, and sort of setting up you know, it's hard to be under the dark cloth and working on this all upside down. And uh, once you finally capture something and you bring it home, you know, it's kind of like that marsh. Like you, it's not that we're trying to take it in like an ownership kind of way, but a, a sampling, right? Mm -hmm. Very beautiful thing, I think, to want to have like a collection of the world that you could have on your mm -hmm. shelf. Mm -hmm. The drawings, if I encased them like this and sort of elevated them up as like these special recordings of, that show the time to sit there in a place, looking at the world and actually doing, you know, the transcribing of what is seen, what is felt, and there it is. And there's such a, you know, looking at, going to any museum and looking at old drawings, you can feel that very, very vividly. That mm -hmm. A person was there, a person looked at this and spent time with it. And so I wanted to have these in there as, as sort of the first raw recordings mm -hmm. that became paintings, right? Because these are three drawings that did become the larger works. Mm -hmm. You've got the lake, there's that crazy pine, and then mm -hmm. you've got the And yeah, I'm a little bit sad that I don't have these drawings anymore because I've got you know, a little binder with them all in there. And I really like 
to go back to that first recording and to hear it and, and think, mm-hmm. okay, it's like that was the actual moment where the experience of being there was taking place. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's it. Is there anything else that you want to add here before we go? That's that, about? Get. that was the painting study after the drawing. Same day. It was mm-hmm. me and uh, a couple of trumpeter swans were out there on the ice with me. Wow. That was cool. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they kind of got used to me, so they didn't fly around. <laughs> it was freezing cold that day. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to walk through the show with us. It's really been a pleasure. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know, so it's even more stuff for us to talk about. I have loved working with you, and I've loved having this show up. It's up through July 30th, so just a little bit more time. If you're here in LA, if you have any questions about anything you saw or want to talk about any of the works, just obviously let me know. Jamie, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, I really appreciate it. So see you later. (laughs) 